Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program, a look at the complex struggle over abortion rights in this country, a struggle that has been in play my entire adult life, and I'm guessing many of yours as well. I'm Marcia Eli, and on behalf of the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History and the Library's Arts and Culture Team, BPL Presents, I want to thank you all for joining us for a conversation that could not be more timely. On December 1st, in just over a week, the Supreme Court will hear a Mississippi case that once again puts overturning Roe v. Wade front and center. Tonight, I am honored to welcome three extraordinary guests to unpack the legal past and present, to talk about the future, and also to help us understand the human narrative behind this seemingly never ending fight. Josh Prager is the author of The Family Row, An American Story, and Catherine Colbert and Julie F.K. are co-authors of Controlling Women, What We Must Do Now to Save Reproductive Freedom. They are a powerhouse of a panel. Um, I think we'll be hearing a good deal about the role of people tonight. At the center of the conflict and at the center of the history are human beings, the lawyers, plaintiffs, judges, advocates, politicians, activists, and strategists who are frequently brilliant and just as frequently flawed, and who are the players that have and will determine the winners and losers in this abortion rights struggle. I'm very eager to hear what all of you have to say, but a few quick notes before I turn it over. First, we will put a link in the chat to a website of a local Brooklyn bookstore, the community bookstore in Park Slope. So the audience, all of you can with a click, learn about the books, The Family Row and Controlling Women. And if you would like purchase copies from a small independent business. Also, uh, as with all Center for Brooklyn History talks, you have the option to engage closed captioning tonight. That button is at the bottom of your screen. And finally, you're invited to share your questions. Just type them throughout the program into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. So now let me say a little bit more about each of our incredibly accomplished guests and turn it over to them. Joshua Prager is an investigative journalist who has written for The Atlantic, Vanity Fair, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. A former Neiman Fellow at Harvard, he also wrote the book, The Echoing Green, which was a Washington Post best book of the year. He dedicated 11 years to researching and writing The Family Row. Josh, welcome. Thank you. Catherine Colbert appeared before the US Supreme Court in 1992 to argue and win Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which is widely credited with saving Roe v. Wade. A co-founder of the Center for Reproductive Rights and the Athena Film Festival, she also created NPR's Justice Talking and the Athena Center for Leadership Studies at Barnard College. As I mentioned, she and our final guest tonight, Julia Kay, are co-authors of the book Controlling Women. Welcome, Kitty. Thanks so much, Marsha. Great to be here. And finally, it's my honor to welcome Julie F.K., who will loosely serve as tonight's moderator. She began her legal career at the Center for Reproductive Rights and then helped lay the groundwork for the legalization of abortion in Ireland by challenging the country's ban before the European Court of Human Rights. Julie, welcome. Everyone, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, for being here. I could say so much more about all of you, but um, obviously I'd much prefer hearing what you have to say. So I turn it, turn it over to you. Thank you, Marcia. And it's so great to be here. Um, we're thankful for the Center for Brooklyn History. And as it enters this exciting new stage as part of my beloved Brooklyn Public Library, um, and also appreciate community book support um, for uh, all literacy in tonight's event. And tonight we're really gonna talk about law, history, and how they influence one another, as well as the individuals at the core of these political debates. And this conversation really centers around one of the most pressing issues of our time, the debate over abortion, um, which as Marcia said, is really coming to uh, another sort of crescendo as the Supreme Court looks at uh, laws out of both Mississippi and also Texas um, in the past month and going forward. Um, I'm 
pleased to be here with Josh, who I've gotten to know through his book and also over Zoom in this new era and with my co-author and longtime partner, Kitty. Um, and I wanted to start, I think, with a question for you, Josh. Um, your book has brought a human, um, sometimes too human aspect to the case of Roe v. Wade um, in a way that I hadn't known much about before. I, um, you know, I know the, the legal history and the case citations, but you've really brought us the people at the core of this case and um, the woman behind Roe. And so can you introduce us a bit to Norma McCorvey, AKA Jane Roe, and tell us what brought you to write about her? Sure, well, first I'll tell you what brought me to it. Um, so I was in France um, 11 years ago in 2010, reading an article in the New Yorker about gay marriage. And the author, Margaret Talbot, mentioned in passing that sometimes a plaintiff um, is good for the cause she helps to represent, and sometimes she isn't. And in the latter category, they mentioned Norma McCorvey, Jane Roe, because she'd sort of famously switched to the other side. She'd become a born again Christian um, in 1995 and then went to fight a campaign against Roe. And it then mentioned that she had not been able to have the abortion that she sought. And then all of a sudden that made sense to me. I said, wow, of course, the case takes longer than a pregnancy. And so um, I then read about it and it turned out that Norma had uh, given birth and placed the child for adoption. And I'd sort of, it hit me that somewhere there is a, now a man or a woman who was then 40 years old. And I saw that the pro-life side looked at this human being as the sort of living incarnation of their arguments against abortion. And I had this feeling that he or she would have learned who she or he had been born to and that it would be a difficult thing to carry. So I went off to look for that person and I found them because I found Norma's private papers. Norma had um, recently broken up with her lifelong partner, a woman named Connie Gonzalez and had left behind along with Connie um, her private papers in her garage um, in Texas. And when I found those papers, I reached out to Norma. She did not want them. Um, I later purchased them from her and they're now at the Schlesinger Library um, at Harvard. But anyway, those papers led me to find the Roe baby, a woman named Shelley. And it was true. She had indeed known who she'd been born to, um, a, um, a tabloid. The National Enquirer had come upon her um, when she was just shy of 19 years old, said, hey, you were born to Jane Roe. And they said, we're going to write about it, whether you like it or not. Shelley had at least prevailed upon them not to include her name. Um, but it was that sort of quest to find this human being and to write about her that led me into the story. But then I sort of paused and I said, wow, okay, look at Norma. There's this remarkable person and my interests traveled very quickly from Norma's three children. She'd given birth to three children with three different men, all placed for adoption, from the children to Norma, to Roe, and then to the whole of abortion in America. I think had I known what I was getting into when I started, I might not have, I might not have undertaken this, but, but I'm glad that I did. Well, great. I, I am too, although I'm, um, you know, 10 years is a long time on a book and the detail and the, and the work of your research really shows through it. Um, and Kitty, I want to turn to the sort of more legal side of it. Um, uh, can you tell us a bit about um, what Roe ultimately stood for, the case, not the woman, and how things changed um, when we got to Casey, the case that you argued before the Supreme Court? Thanks, Julie. And uh, as Josh's um, description uh, began, uh, at the time that Roe was uh, first issued by the Supreme Court, uh, the court had not yet adopted a theory that allowed a pregnant woman to go ahead and have an abortion before the case. So in fact, uh, at the time, in order to prosecute the case, uh, Norma would have had to carry to term in order to be a plaintiff. That's not the reason she, she carried to term, but it, in fact, that was the law at the time. Roe established a, what we, lawyers call a fundamental right to choose abortion. That means that it gets the highest level of constitutional mm -hmm. protection, and it protected the decision in consultation with a woman's doctor. It didn't 
uh, apply independently to a woman. It was really the conversation, the decision-making process between a woman and her doctor that got the highest level of constitutional protection. Almost within about two to three years after Roe was issued by the Supreme Court by a seven to two vote, a number of states began to pass restrictions on abortion that were really intended to undermine the original ruling. And those were uh, led by a number of both the Norm uh, Mormon Church and the Catholic Church who put millions and millions of dollars into opposition to abortion. Um, and uh, we began to see incursions on the right as it was first established in Roe. But it wasn't until 1992, uh, after the, the composition of the court had radically changed, that we uh, saw the first time in which Roe was really in jeopardy. And let me just bring you back to that. That was in 1991, uh, right after Clarence Thomas was appointed to the court, and he became the fifth justice uh, who had uh, essentially said that they opposed abortion. Um, I was uh, counsel to the plaintiffs in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. It was decided by the Court of Appeals about um, two days after the nomination of Clarence Thomas was um, confirmed. Uh, and uh, basically, from the second we knew our case was going to the Supreme Court, uh, we also knew that there were five votes against us on that court. I often say uh, everything I needed to know to, to argue a case in the Supreme Court I learned on Sesame Street. Why? Because you need to learn to count. And the only number that matters is five. And at the time that Casey went to the Supreme Court, there were five justices uh, prepared to overturn Roe, uh, much like there are today. And I'm sure we will get to that uh, later on in this conversation. But the important point is we thought we were going to lose. Um, and we actually did lose uh, when the justices uh, took the first vote on the case. Uh, they went back to their conference room after my argument. They voted seven to two uh, against us, saying, in fact, uh, the Pennsylvania restrictions ought to be upheld. And Justice Rehnquist, then the Chief Justice, uh, wrote an opinion that overturned Roe, that basically said states are again free to criminalize abortion, uh, as they had done in the, as Texas had done in the days before Roe and at many, many other states. Um, and so it wasn't until the last minute change of heart uh, by Justice Kennedy uh, that we uh, were uh, given a reprieve. Uh, the court in Casey established not that highest level of constitutional protection, but what, what I think of as a mid-level, basically saying states can pass barriers to abortion so long as those barriers do not create an undue burden on women. And that's a legal term. Uh, but basically, it means that courts have a lot of discretion to determine what's undue and what's not undue. Uh, and in the intervening years, since that case was decided in 1992, we've seen many, many states pass restrictions on abortion and have them upheld by an increasingly conservative court. And, and I think that's really important to note that so many of the restrictions that have come along post Casey have been brought by red states and are um, waiting periods or counseling women to uh, not have an abortion or clinic regulations that require kind of hospital level standards for a very safe procedure that you wouldn't see on other kinds of outpatient services. Um, and that these, these restrictions really have an impact on the most marginalized women, whether it's teens or women in rural areas, um, low-income women, and disproportionately these regulations restrict access for women of color who are seeking abortions. And so I think that begs the question of sort of this um, middle ground and finding the middle ground. And Josh, this is something you talk about and, and that comes up in some of the various players and um, I don't know if you use the word characters when they're real life, but a lot of the, the people involved were real characters in the way you describe them. Um, but can you talk somewhat about what a middle ground might look like and what you say it might calm some of the political divisions and, um, you know, what do we look at as far as balancing restrictions, um, but also really not having uh, women in the most desperate situations bearing the brunt? You know, that's a very good question. I feel sort of um, intimidated answering it with the two of you right here. That's not really my line of work, but I could give it a go. But I did want to first just say 
um, a little bit about Norma because you'd ask sort of who she was. So if it's okay, we'll go a tiny bit out of order. Yes, here. and you shouldn't feel intimidated or tag teamed in uh, any way. During this. Well, easier <laughs> said than done. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of Norma and her bio, her biography speaks to this because she was very much sort of you know a disenfranchised person um, um, who was in a state, obviously. I mean, to this day, where women who want to have abortions have a tough go of it because of so many restrictions. She was in Texas. But just to sort of lay it out sort of quickly, her biography. So um, Norma, what I wanted to show um, when I wrote about Norma was sort of not just the biography, her own biography, but where she came from. And I learned that she was the third consecutive sort of generation in her family to be a young person who had gotten pregnant and, um, and not wanted that pregnancy, all unmarried. There were all three women in religious homes. They went from sort of Pentecostal to Jehovah's Witness, first Catholic actually, and then evangelical with Norma. But what happened was with Norma, um, when Norma was raised by a woman who, when she had gotten pregnant at 17 years old, um, she had been made to he disappeared. She had to leave her town um, along the Atchafalaya River in Louisiana. She went to Baton Rouge. She gave birth. The child was then taken away from her, raised by her parents. And this woman was devastated, Mary, Norma's mother. She was devastated. She became an alcoholic. <clears throat> and she was the woman who, who raised Norma. And Norma grew up in a home, a broken home, um, where um, uh, Mary had endless affairs with a lot of the men she served alcohol to in these little bars in Louisiana and then Texas. And when Norma um, was 12 or 13 years old, she was sent off to schools for quote unquote delinquent children. She had all sorts of behavioral problems. When she then came out to her mother as gay, her mother beat her. Mary spoke to me very openly about that, almost proudly about that fact. <clears throat> and then um, Norma was 16 years old when she got married. She then um, had a child and did not want to raise it quickly was divorced, and she gave the child to her mother and basically begged her mother to take the child off of her hands, her eldest daughter, Melissa. Norma later lied about that and said that she um, had had the child kidnapped from her. That's written in her biography, her autobiography, I Am Roe, but she asked her mother to sort of take Melissa from her. And then Norma um, had a very difficult life. She sold drugs for a while. She was a prostitute for a while. She didn't um, hadn't spoken of that before um, she spoke to me about it. And um, she then um, had gave birth to another child. She relinquished to adoption. And she was then pregnant for the third time in 1969 um, when she was sort of desperate to have an abortion, was resigned because her, her um, doctor would not perform one. She finally went back to the um, adoption attorney who had brokered the previous adoptions of her children. And he said, you know what? His name was Henry McCluskey. He said, I went to school with a woman named Linda Coffey. Um, we went to law school together and she just told me that she's looking for a plaintiff, someone to challenge the abortion um, laws here in Texas. And I don't know if that will help you to get an abortion, but why don't I connect you? And that is how Norma was then connected to Linda and then on to Sarah Weddington and became Jane Rowe. Um, so that's just to give our audience a little bit of sense of who she, she, she was. In terms of this sort of middle ground, you know, what really interested me actually in writing this book was charting the sort of politicization of abortion and understanding how we got to this point. Obviously, you know, one of the most remarkable things I learned was that the first time um, there was a confirmation of a justice after Roe, Justice Stevens, he wasn't even asked about abortion at his confirmation hearing, which is sort of incredible. And what I did was, so as to be able to sort of talk about this in human terms, I chose different people on the two sides of this issue. Um, there were, there was two doctors really from Texas, Dr. Curtis Boyd, who started providing abortions in Texas pre-Roe, and now is the largest provider of third trimester abortions in America. He assumed that sort of role after his friend George Tiller was murdered. And then on the other side, a woman named Mildred Jefferson, who was the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Medical School. Her career is sort of sabotaged by racism and misogyny. She becomes um, a pro-life advocate and the head of the National Right to Life Committee and is a very important person in terms of sort of 
politicizing abortion. And I think in some ways, as these two characters went, so too went their movements. Um, we follow, for example, Curtis Boyd. Initially, he won't provide, a, he won't perform abortions past 16 weeks, then past viability and on and on and on. And similarly, Mildred Jefferson, who initially um, sees room for compromise, she then gets to the point where she believes um, that abortion ought never to be legal, um, that all abortion is sort of murder. I guess in terms of, you know, an answer to your actual question, I think about what we have in sort of Western Europe. Um, but it's hard for me to imagine, um, and, and the two of you can speak to this so much better than I can, but it's hard for me to imagine something like that taking root here, basically where abortion is legal only up until an earlier point in a pregnancy. But until that point, not only is the state sort of not standing in your way by putting all of these incredible restrictions on you and making you, you know, I mean, we can talk about all the things that a woman today must now go through, but the state actually helps you. In France, for example, abortion is free and available at, 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 at hospitals everywhere, provided it's paid for by insurance, et cetera. Well, and so, contraception too. I mean, I think it's a whole access to healthcare and they don't have the, you know, the US has a horrific rate of maternal mortality, particularly for women of color. I mean, race equity plays into our healthcare system as well. But, um, you know, I, I think you're right that it's, we're not even at the point of talking about limitations exactly. because we're making it so much harder to get access to abortion. And, exactly. and yet we still have such a high rate of first trimester abortions here. Kitty, go ahead. The problem, Josh, of doing, uh, using the two examples you use and even using the example of Norma McCorvey is that the world is a lot more complicated than both the extremes on either side and one particular plaintiff in one particular case. And I think what really bears uh, telling is that almost a million women a year have abortions and they're not all alike. They come to that decision for a huge number of reasons that are very personal to them. Um, almost half of them are married and have children already. Uh, they're not uh, situations of teenage pregnancy like you described with uh, Norma McCorvey. Uh, many of them are, uh, you know, coming from a variety of different backgrounds, different income levels, et cetera. And I think one of the things that uh, people always want to do is to reach a compromise on this issue. And to me, the compromise is a constitutional right. That is what our nation was set up to do to establish the Constitution to protect minority interests uh, in the event that people disagree about fundamental questions. So in my view, the, the best compromise is to leave the decision to the individual based on the circumstances of his or her life uh, and to then uh, go forward with whatever that is. I think policymakers want to say, OK, well, let's just you know split it in half, let people have some for certain times up to certain uh, periods of time. That really doesn't work. And let me tell you why. When you have uh, basically 90% of all abortions are performed in the first trimester. Uh, okay, that wouldn't be your compromise in terms of half, that's 90%. But the other 10% are having abortions for a whole range of reasons, partly a result of their health, partly a result of uh, barriers that are put in their way so that they delay, partly as a result of not, no good sex education so they don't know they're even pregnant. Um, but only a very, very small number, the Curtis Boyd uh, patients, are less than half of 1% of all abortions that are performed. And so that is a post-viability abortion. So it seems to me it's really, really important for us to go back to the facts about who's getting abortions, why they're being performed, how we can protect their interests, and use the Constitution which really has been the document that has guided this country as a way to say, when there's deep conflict on an issue, let's leave it to individuals to decide. I'll, I'll just respond to that to say something about Curtis Boyd. Yeah, I make abundantly clear in the book, you know, how tiny a percentage, obviously, third trimester abortions are. Um, you know, I mentioned him because of his sort of progression. He actually is the he is really the man who pioneered more than anyone the standard method of second trimester abortions, actually, d &E, dilation and evacuation. And he was an incredibly important person. If for, I looked at him as so important 
even setting aside his sort of contributions to third and second trimester abortion, but really because of his attitude about abortion. Um, he took great issue with President Clinton, for example, saying that abortion ought to be safe, legal, and rare. He said, well, why should it be rare? Abortion is, to use his words, a social and moral good. It empowers women. It enables them to lead the lives that they live. And he was completely impenitent about abortion. And that was really what sort of drew me um, to write about him. Um, and in terms of Norma, just one other thing to say about that. Obviously, you're right. Um, she, there are women have, you know, when you have a million women a year having an abortion, they're going to have them for different reasons. Um, what I actually came away feeling about Norma was because, and we can talk about this more, she was never embraced by the pro-choice movement. For, there were, they had reason to be wary of her. For example, she had famously lied about how she had gotten pregnant. Um, she said that she'd been raped when she hadn't. But even after years of sort of trying to ingratiate herself to the movement, she was really kept at arm's length. And to my mind, it's nice for, for, for it to be clear that, as you say, abortion is a right for every type of woman, not just the person who knows how to speak about it in sort of the language of now or NARAL. And Norma never was able to sort of, you know, fill that role. And she never felt at home in the movement. And that is in large part why she then switched over to the other side. I, I thought that was a really interesting part of the book because um, I, you know, having worked in the US and in Ireland with, you know, getting women to raise their voices about their abortion experience, there is such a bright and judgmental light on anyone who has an abortion that it, it is very hard to sort of, you know, there are no perfect plaintiffs, but to get spokespeople and, you know, you want to work with somebody who has had an abortion, but not two and for the right reason. And often the people who become sort of the heroes and um, and uh, of the movement are people who are women who have had complications where they wanted pregnancy and that becomes the face of it. And I, I found in looking for um, plaintiffs or, or applicants to be at the heart of the Irish case that I brought to the European Court of Human Rights, where we were looking for individual women, it was very important to me to bring it on behalf of more than one woman, because we didn't want that kind of judgment to, you know, tip the case one way or the other, and to really show kind of a range of normal circumstances, shall we say, of why women get abortion services and, and what kinds of situations people find themselves in that leads to that um, I, I think now with looking at the lawsuits in the US in particular that most, if not all of the abortion rights cases are brought on behalf of doctors and that's part of what came out um, of the jurisprudence around Roe was that a doctor could represent their patient and, and stand in as a plaintiff. Um, that's something I think that the anti-abortion movement has been trying to um, have, you know, get us away from and, and make less possible certainly in the recent um, legislation coming out of Texas. Uh, they have very cleverly kind of set up a number of different legal apparatus that makes it hard to stop that law from going into effect. It's been in effect now in Texas since September 1st um, and has been really devastating to abortion services in Texas. Um, so I think it's, there's really kind of two sides of the coin of having individual plaintiffs. And I, I think it's really hard to have somebody up there as the face of a movement. And, and what you wrote about Norma really showed why. Um, there's financial incentives. There's, you know, she struggled with her own issues in life. Um, and I could see why those in the you know, decision-making corridors around the abortion rights movement were didn't want to put that kind of vulnerability on the whole movement or put yeah. one particular face on it. And, and both to protect Norma as well. And I'm not sure that when Gloria Allred um, was involved with Norma, that she had those same protective instincts, shall we say, for better or for worse. So I, I found it fascinating reading those, those stories. Yeah. I mean, one thing just sort of along those lines, you know, the subtitle of my book is An American Story. And I have, when I write that, I'm thinking about sort of more macro level, why here in America is this the issue that it is, but also, in terms of Norma, you know, here you have this woman who obviously um, her case goes to the Supreme Court. And then you mentioned Gloria Allred. I mean, how American. She's whisked off literally to Hollywood um, and is doing, you know, she's doing photo shoots and, and, and eating at all the fanciest restaurants. And then when she um, becomes born again, she's 
um, being baptized by, you know, an evangelical minister in a Texas swimming pool who dyes his hair and, uh, and his teeth and the cameras are rolling. I mean, it's a very American story where you have sort of, she almost becomes a sort of a type of a celebrity in a way that it's hard to imagine happening elsewhere. Yeah, I, I, Josh, I would characterize it a little bit more maliciously, which is she's become used by people who want to Absolutely. take advantage of her stuff. Absolutely. Agreed. And I think that's really a problem. And I think as a lawyer who's represented many, many doctors who come to the court uh, representing their patients' interests, we were always very, very careful, A, not to be exploitative of our clients, B, to let them speak when they wanted to speak. And very often that was less often than you would think would be interested. As a journalist, you would want that person to speak but very often our plaintiffs did not want to do so. One of the reasons the leaders of the movement took that kind of professional role is because our clients or the people we represented did not want to have uh, that say. I, let me just give you a personal example. I was very active in the fight against the partial birth abortion ban uh, that Congress passed. We represented uh, nine women, all with wanted pregnancies who were willing to come forward and be public. And that was the first time uh, in a very long time that women were willing, uh, as plaintiffs in cases, uh, were willing to do that. And frankly, the reason they were willing to do it is because their pregnancies were wanted uh, as opposed to unintended and unwanted. And therefore the stigma that attaches to them, uh, they all had, uh, uh, pregnancies with very, very severe fetal anomalies. They needed abortions close to or after viability because there was no likelihood of survival. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it was a story they could tell without shame. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen to too many other uh, plaintiffs. So I, I would love to go back to this American story um, because I do think this is such an American issue. I mean, it's a global human rights issue, but the way it plays out here, um, you had mentioned Dr. Mildred Jefferson um, earlier, the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Medical School and how um, she went on to be a leader in the anti-abortion movement and key to President Reagan's embracing of an anti-abortion stance. Apparently, yeah. um, Dr. Jefferson was very persuasive, but um, you know, I think one of the really interesting pieces of the abortion debate is how um, gender equity and racial equity kind of intersect and interact in, in this both, um, you know, from the very beginning with Dr. Jefferson, but certainly in how the movement has developed and how, um, you know, access to abortion has kind of fallen along race equity lines in, in a very American way. Um, tell us a little bit more about Dr. Jefferson and sort of what her, I guess, legacy is uh, around race in the abortion debate. Yeah, it's fascinating. So Dr. Jefferson is looked at um, by the pro-life community as this as a really a saint because they say she left the highest levels of her job you know harvard trained surgeon and devoted herself to the unborn that's what they say well the truth of the matter is it's a lot more complicated than that um she wanted to be a surgeon but president nixon appointed her to um, a medical board in 1973 as a result of that i was able to get an fbi file that was about that on her and what you read there is that actually um, she, her career was sabotaged. Here you have doctors speaking very openly about the fact that because she's black, because she's a woman, they're not gonna hire her, they're not gonna promote her, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She's really incredibly upset. To that point, she had been a superstar. Everything she willed sort of came to be. She believed endlessly. She was like a prophet of self-determination. That was what she believed in. And then all of a sudden, um, that wasn't happening. And she, meanwhile, her private life was very difficult. She had fallen in love with a white man at a time when interracial marriage was illegal in roughly half of the country. And by the time they get married, she's so upset and disgusted with the sort of injustices of life that she tells this man that she will never um, bring a child into this world. Now, later, she told everyone in the pro-life community that the reason she didn't have children was because she wasn't able to. But in reality, she had chosen not to. Very interesting. Here you have the same woman who is saying that every single conception must lead to a birth, choosing herself not to get pregnant. Anyway, 
What's so incredible is that in 1970, she sort of hears the American Medical Association says, hey, doctors, if you're in a state where um, uh, abortion is now legal, you need to defer to those state laws. She gets very angry about this and she joins the movement. Well, the very same parts of her biography that were such sort of obstacles in the medical world, the fact that she was black, the fact that she was a woman, all of a sudden became like enormous assets in the pro-life world. Here was a group of people that were basically white Catholic men and she was a black Methodist woman. And they were desperate to sort of put her, you know, smiling face in front of the cameras. She was also incredibly, incredibly sort of, you know, well-spoken. And she was on the Advocates, a PBS show, railing against um, um, abortion when Governor Reagan um, tuned in, as you say, um, and, and say, he, I, I found a letter that he wrote her. He said, you know what, you've convinced me that I no longer um, wish to um, support abortion. He'd obviously famously um, signed in 1967 the, the Therapeutic Abortion Act. So, you know, race was an enormous part of her life um, in terms of how it led her into the, into the abortion world. What was so kind of sad and devastating is that she wasn't able to look at the fact that the very things that might have benefited her personally would benefit other people. And she just sort of stuck rigidly um, to the, you know, to her pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I don't believe in affirmative action. I don't believe, you know, in helping in any social programs that might help women, et cetera. Um, she ended up dying at home alone in a sea of her papers in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's sort of a sad story, um, but she was a fascinating window into that world. And I, let me just say, Josh, not unlike many of the leaders of causes that are very anti-feminist uh, in that era. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they took on leadership roles. They, you know, advocated in a feminist manner, mm -hmm. uh, but worked against uh, other women uh, caught in similar or worse circumstances. And, uh, yeah. you know, Clarence Thomas isn't so far from that, mo that mold either. So uh, I, I think the important part of all of this, though, comes back to us being cautious about using great stories as a uh, window into how the world actually operates. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. I think it was also a really interesting to see how the debate now is so much framed as a women's health debate by those who oppose abortion rights. And so there's been a shift in language. Um, there is, I think, an attempt by the anti-abortion movement to put more women at the forefront, or at least as spokespeople for their movement, um, less so, I think, with women of color. Um, but similarly, the you know pro-choice movement has, in the past and somewhat still now, been accused of you know, putting white women at the forefront and not looking at race equity issues. And I think there's been a lot of good and deep conversation um, with the reproductive justice movement, which is led by women of color and black women in particular, and really, you know, looking at abortion as an issue that's part of reproductive freedom and reproductive justice and looking both at the right to have an abortion, but also the right to parent and to do so in safety and with resources. And that's, I think, been a really positive change in the you know, abortion rights pro-choice movement over the past few decades. Um, but we're still facing a lot of, um, I think, racism in the rhetoric coming out of um, the anti-abortion movement in that calling it uh, that abortion is is a racist act and all these kinds of um, you know trying to paint abortion rights as black genocide those kinds of things that are really you know I think some of the most reprehensible and manipulative kinds of uh, elements of the anti-abortion movement and and that sometimes also ironically align with the white supremacist movement we've seen a lot of overlap between those two so. I was fascinated to learn about Dr. Jefferson all the way to her porting of papers and the, yeah. the visual really stuck in my head. So, um. And I'll just say one thing, you mentioned the sort of shift in the focus in some sense on the pro-life side from just being focused on the fetus to saying, hey, this actually harms the woman, the pregnant woman. Well, Norma was a big part of that because Alan Parker, the man who's the head of the Justice Foundation, who's big, who's big, um, 
undertaking is collecting affidavits from women who say that they have been harmed psychologically by abortion. It was Norma, when he became Norma's lawyer um, and represented her in a case seeking to overturn Roe, McCorvey v. Hill, that enabled him to begin to sort of introduce those affidavits into the judicial system. And one of those affidavits obviously gets then cited by Justice Kennedy in Gonzalez v. Carhart, um, which was sort of, you know, remarkable. And to say just, you know, we talk about storytelling and obviously you have both sides, you mentioned the stigma, the importance of sort of humanizing issues, both sides are trying to do that. Well, Norma being sort of piggybacking Norma's story enabled me to sort of, because she started off on one side and went to the other, enabled me to sort of wend my way through this, you know, very complicated issue. And it was fascinating to see that she even was involved um, with, with this very same shift that you're talking about. Actually, Josh, that happened much, much earlier uh, than the case she brought. Uh, the effort to try to say that abortion protects women's health uh, began as early as, as the mid-80s, uh, well before my case in, in Thornburg, which was the first time I went to the Supreme Court. So we heard those arguments, but let me address that because well, I think- Excuse me, I just want, I, that I know, but what I'm saying is it was these affidavits that just- yeah, but those affidavits me. were in all of those earlier cases. So all I'm saying is, um, the anti-abortion movement in, in many ways have put three reasons to support their opposition to abortion. One is religion, one is protection of fetal life, and the third is protection of women's health. And it's none of those things, okay? Re if religion was the cause, we wouldn't see only some religions being represented because there's obviously great diversity of religious belief on this question. Many of uh, most mainstream uh, uh, Christian faiths, for example, support abortion rights in many circumstances. So uh, if this was really about religion, uh, it would represent the true diversity of religious beliefs. Rather, it's some religions trying to impose their beliefs on others. And similarly, fetal rights, because obviously, uh, the interest in protection, protecting fetal health goes much broader than abortion. We have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the, in the world, uh, in the developed world. We're 33 out of 36 developed countries in terms of the uh, amount of infant mortality. So if in fact fetal rights were the issue, uh, there'd be a much greater protection of them. And similarly, women's health. I mean, abortion is one of the safest medical procedures there is, much safer than childbirth. So it can't be uh, a grounds to protect uh, women's interests. And I think what Julie and I say in the book over and over again is what this question really is about is controlling women and taking away the ability of women to make decisions about their lives that contribute to their own equality and their own autonomy and their own self-determination. And if you say only certain kinds of people should have babies, only married couples who are uh, in uh, heterosexual relationships, who uh, if only those people can have children, uh, then you, <clears throat> you not only control women's lives, <clears throat> excuse me, but you uh, make sure that your vision of society rather than the vision of individuals uh, is determinative. And so I think it's really important for us to take those questions on directly. Uh, we don't do that enough. Uh, and uh, this health thing, uh, it, it just, it, let me just give one more thing is, it is really clear uh, <clears throat> that there is no psychological a negative effect of abortion. Uh, the anti-abortion movement has been pushing this uh, post-abortion stress syndrome is their reason that uh, abortion is bad for women's health. There's no such thing. And the American Psychological Association has repeatedly said abortion is, is not only a healthy thing for women to choose in the, if they so desire, uh, but, but there's no negative psychological effect of having an abortion either. Not only that, oh, but there are, I'm just sorry to add to that, <laughs> but there are um, studies that show that there is um, a correlation with um, that there, that adoption, um, relinquishing children to adoption does often take a psychological toll on a woman. In other words, the very thing that the 
pro-life community is telling women that they ought to do, that is complicated. So Well, and right. you really, you saw that a lot in your book with the three daughters and their different experiences and norms. I um, would be remiss as a semi-moderator if um, we've talked about the past and the present and we need to look at the future, um, both the the glass half empty and how to fill it. Um, so so give us a, an overview of what to expect. I, I would say we should focus on Mississippi. I think the Texas case is kind of the toddler that's causing the tantrum and getting everyone's attention, but the Mississippi case that's being argued on December 1st is the real threat. So Kitty, can you give us the, uh, the lawyerly yeah. case on that? Unfortunately, Julie, I do want to explain Texas so people really understand why it's not significant. Uh, Texas, as you know, passed the most punitive law we've seen on abortion uh, since Roe versus Wade. It bans abortion as of about five weeks. That's not the most punitive part. It also allows individuals to bring lawsuits against any provider or somebody who uh, is um, helping a woman get an abortion. And it is that aspect of the case that is currently being considered in the Supreme Court. That is, can a, a state delegate its enforcement powers to total strangers uh, and uh, absolve itself of responsibility for enforcement of the law? And that question is currently before the Supreme Court, but it only addresses who can you sue and where can you sue, i.e. can you sue the state in federal court? All right, but you have to get to the Mississippi case because we're going getting to, right. questions in the chat. So. All right. So. <laughs> Let me just finish, though. It's important for people to understand that the, what is not at issue in Texas is the constitutionality of abortion regulation. And that is at issue in Mississippi uh, because the Mississippi law bans abortion as of 15 weeks of pregnancy well before viability. My case established that you have a right to choose abortion up to viability. Any restriction that is less than that places the, the seminal question, is Roe versus Wade still the law of the land before the court? Uh, it is my view that they are gonna say, no, Roe is no longer the law, Casey is no longer the law, and they are going to, again, permit states to ban abortion as they did in the days before Roe. And I think that's important. I mean, two points. One is that uh, the uh, Supreme Court is the floor, not the ceiling. So the Supreme Court is likely to turn the question over to the states. More than half of them are likely to ban abortion. Um, and those in the blue states, such as New York, where we are, um, or uh, and the sort of 14 other states in the District of Columbia are going to really have to increase uh, the services that they provide, particularly for sort of uh, women and people seeking abortions along a migration trail. Um, it's definitely going to be another long battle, and it, we're going to have to really support people and make sure that medication available is much more widely available um, for people traveling and particularly for low-income women. Um, and Josh, one of the questions that, that came up um, in the Q&A or in the chat was um, about terminology. And um, in your book, you call people sort of the organizations, how they name themselves of pro-life and pro-choice. Um, Kitty and I are more, much more likely to be the abortion rights activists and those who oppose abortion. Talk a little bit about how you made the decision around language and what's the power of language in this debate. Yeah, obviously it all starts with language. Um, you know, when I, the great majority of the sort of terms that I use would not probably endear me to the pro-life side. And I'll get to why I use that term in a second. For example, I do not think that a zygote is the same thing as a baby. And so I don't call, you know, a zygote a baby or an embryo or a fetus. Um, similarly, I don't call um, a woman who is pregnant a mother and on and on and on. But I said to myself that I'm going to allow sort of a group to call themselves what they wish in terms of the pro-life movement. I point out, of course, some of the if, if life is your you know number one sort of criterion, then I point out a lot of the inconsistencies and hypocrisies. For example, what we just saw happening or what we see happening right now in terms of COVID. Um, and other policies that people in, 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 in that si on that side do not support, for example, well, without going to the whole thing. So yes, but I, I was mindful of that. And to me, I think um, 
that was a decision that I made. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that it did, at least initially, and I didn't set out to do it this way, but I think it also enabled people to feel comfortable initially to speak with me. And um, I was able to interview really everyone um, that I wanted to sort of on both sides of this issue, um, whether they were the head of Operation Rescue or the head of Planned Parenthood. And I think part of that um, came from my being sort of, you know, genuinely um, open to hearing what they had to say. I think that's a great distinction too about the labels versus the context. Um, a lot of the work um, that I did in Ireland was in the human rights tribunal. And I saw that when we started talking about abortion as a fundamental human right and making those decisions about whether and when and with whom to have a family or not, um, that's really what struck women and abortion rights supporters in particular, that that's what's at stake in this debate and that we do need to talk in those terms and not as uh, you know, getting into the when does life begin or your religion versus my religion. So um, I like that distinction, especially between zygotes and, and the very inflammatory language of the unborn and the preborn. Yeah. Um, Kitty, can you talk a little bit about the what we do now um, that we're not looking at the court to save us? How can we uh, take action to protect reproductive freedom? Absolutely, Julie, and that is the subtitle of our book, um, What Can We Do Now? Because we think that uh, while it is not the Supreme Court that is going to save us, uh, we can uh, and must save ourselves by quit uh, hitting our heads against that marble staircase and begin to look at other strategies. I'm going to talk about three of those strategies kind of in general terms, and there's many, many specifics we got. I think we have 58 different policy alternatives laid out in the book. Uh, but first and foremost, we need to help women who are living in states where abortion is banned. And what's likely to happen once the Supreme Court overturns Roe and Casey is that we will see bans implemented in over 20 states that can range from Georgia west to Texas, from North Dakota south to Arizona, a huge landmass. And many of those women, hundreds of thousands of women in those states, will be unable to obtain safe and legal abortion within their state uh, and will have to travel. So we need to help those women travel. We need to help them get appropriate information. Uh, we need to help them get availability of uh, medication abortion which is the ability to take a couple of pills, uh, misoprostol uh, uh, being the, the primary one, and mifepristone, uh, and self-induce self uh, an abortion, which is a likely alternative for many of the women in those states. And we need to make sure that they have the resources, information, and financial help they need. Uh, but second, and I think to me this is the, the most important, is we have to stop depending on the courts and therefore turn our attention to electing public officials who actually support the right to choose abortion. There are 500,000 elected uh, uh, officials in this country, many of whom have responsibilities, including passing state laws, uh, regulating or, or administering uh, state laws, that uh, school board elections, et cetera, uh, which affect uh, the right to choose abortion, and we need uh, advocates for our point of view in those elected officials. First and foremost, flipping the legislatures in the 25 states that are likely to pass bans, uh, making sure purple states become blue and blue states remain blue. And the reason I talk about red and blue is unlike the days before Roe, unlike the days even in the mid 80s in which abortion didn't break down on party lines. Today, the Republican Party is anti-abortion, the Democratic Party is pro-choice, and if leadership is in either of those camps, uh, that determines what's likely to happen in that state. So we do need to think very seriously about uh, the red-blue split and make sure that more states uh, have protective laws for women on their books. And that is only available if we elect state legislators who care about the issue. And uh, Josh, I think that sort of heads us back to everything old is new again, as uh, learning from our, our history and the stories of women who have had abortions and the people who have helped them. And I guess 
my question to you as a journalist is, you know, what do you see us needing to do to influence and change public opinion and, and to really grab that kind of political power that Kitty's talking about? A good question. I'm unfortunately not optimistic. I think our country is so polarized. It's hard for me to sort of imagine, you know, swaying large number of, of, of people. I do think that storytelling is important. Um, and I think both sides recognize that. I think that's why, for example, you see the initiatives online, um, one in three and shot your abortion, on and on and on. I think it's so stigmatized that one of the with abortions, obviously it's rooted in a right to privacy. It was sort of initially, but that very same privacy, that very same right enables us not to talk about abortion. Um, and then, you know, half the country can say that this is something that has nothing to do with them. So I think it's a complicated thing. I think that's probably a little bit why, in my opinion, that's one of the reasons that anyway, um, the gay marriage sort of lost its sting somewhat, or at least lost its sort of um, edge as a political issue, because we all know people who, who are gay, people we love, and we say, hey, why shouldn't they be able to be married to? Um, but um, I, I think it's- Josh, wait a second. I just wanted to correct you on that, which is uh, one in five women in America have abortions. Yes. Okay? And, no, and my point America. being that, but they don't talk about it. I, under I understand yeah. that. But the other point I really want to emphasize is that 75% of Americans believe that this question ought to remain between a woman and her doctor and not the government. So we don't actually need to convince anyone. Uh, we just need to activate those people who agree with us because we are the majority uh, in this country. Well, we need to convince them to vote like it matters. And I think that's, you know, part of this polarization is that people care so much about issues that are, you know, boogeymen under the bed and not the reality of their lives and the people that they know. And I mean, I having watched this kind of play out in Ireland, a so-called Catholic country where they got marriage equality well before they got abortion rights. And one of the stories that was really the tipping point was, again, this woman who had a wanted pregnancy right. who was not treated to be to happen happened um, to her that she was in the hospital and because her medical team could still hear a fetal heartbeat, they wouldn't treat her and eventually she died in sepsis. We saw the same thing happen in Poland um, in September that just has become the kind of public outpouring and you know I think those kinds of horribly tragic circumstances with the right woman at their core can become a tipping point and you know, I, I have to be optimistic, Josh, that we can do that. We can. Have I, I agree. Order. And I, you know, obviously just devoted a decade to this. And I believe in that, you know, if 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 Norma is is Norma and her family are, are a very clear um, illustration of what happens when abortion is not legal. Three consecutive generations. These are devastating consequences. And I'll talk about that in terms of the power of personal experience and exposure. You know, Justice Blackman wrote about that in the preamble to Roe, um, the sort of, you know, the exposure to the raw edges of human existence, how it informs what we think about abortion. He didn't mention, obviously, there that his own daughter, Sally, had been unhappily pregnant in college a few years before. There's a similar story with Justice Powell that I mentioned, where a tragic story of um, a, a messenger boy in the law firm where he worked came to him because he brought his girlfriend um, to get an abortion and she had died and now he was wanted for, for manslaughter. And so I do think that personal exposure, exposure to stories and, you know, this, this matters. It makes it real. It makes it tragic and people understand what's at stake. And I you talked a lot about that with Dr. Boyd too, who was providing second trimester abortions and was sort of reconsidering his own views of denying women care when he yes. had an individual story in front. And, you know, the old joke, non-joke is, you know, where, do, where does everybody agree that there should be legal abortion, rape, rape incest, incest and me? And me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you never know if we can tell that joke or not, because I've always thought it's a little bit whatever, but I saw it in your book, so I figure we can say it at this point. No, and one of the things was remarkable is he would see people campaigning, you know, um, boycotting his clinic and these are you know his clinic was burned down his life was threatened and yet some of those very same people privately would come to him for an abortion or they would bring their mistress or their wife or their daughter so i think it's true and it's okay to write in the and, and josh it's not just curtis boyd i Obviously, represented yeah. hundreds of abortion clinics across this country yeah. and that story is told by every single one of them yeah. and that's what come brings me back to the importance of the Constitution in all of this, which is where you have deep division for whatever political reason, 
it's important to let the individual, the rights of the individual to make decisions control, rather than uh, having the state impose that on all of us. And I, I think, look, I think that's a nice, the, the elusive middle ground that we all agree on is really looking to people to talk about why it matters to them, whether it's Paxton Smith, the Texas valedictorian who put it more eloquently, I think, than, than certainly I can now or could at age 17. Um, and with, you know, Thanksgiving and the holidays upon us, when people are having these conversations, hopefully they won't be polarizing, but really provide an opportunity for people to say, this is why this issue is important to me. Um, you know, particularly for younger women, it's about getting an education and childbearing and control over their lives and whether and when and with whom to have a child. And I think for all all of us, it's about what do we say as a culture and as a society when we stigmatize that kind of decision making or take it out of people's hands. And um, so I just I want to thank you, Josh, for being in somewhat of a tag team, but you can blame the uh, the Center for Brooklyn History for lining us up. But I think it's been a really interesting conversation. And I um, recommend that everybody read both books together because I think they're kind of two different pieces of a very big political and personal conversation that uh, we'll all be having more and more uh, conversation discussion around, certainly as the Supreme Court looks at this, but moreover, as we find other ways forward and to really increase reproductive freedom as one of our core fundamental human rights. It's very Thank American. You. Thank you. It was um, a pleasure to, to, to speak about this with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. But, and I want to thank um, all three of you for this conversation and for your books. Um, you know, I started by saying my entire adult life has been watching this struggle play out, tug of war back and forth. Um, you know, but one thing that we have is perspective on the history that we lived through, those of us who lived through Roe, and you get some of that here, you really understand the human story. And you, and you understand alternative ways to, to fight the fight if you want to do that through this book. So they really do complement each other. Um, the, the link to the community bookstore is, is in the chat for those of you who want to explore these two books. Uh, and you can, of course, go to the library as well. And mostly, I just want to thank you all for, your, for the work that you're doing. Um, it's important work on all all levels um, and all, uh, you know, in every way. Uh, and thank everybody here for being here tonight. I hope you all have a good holiday uh, and, and have, a, have a great night. Thanks, Marsha. Thank you. Thank you.